Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. This week, I speak with Kent Walker, the head of global affairs at Google, who oversees the company's AI ethics and responsible AI innovation. Kent talked about how Google reviews AI systems for trust and safety and talked about the outlook for safe AI going forward. I hope you find the conversation as informative as I did. I'm Kim Walker. I oversee a global affairs group at Google that includes policy, legal, our trust and safety work, our philanthropy, and our responsible innovation teams. I've been working in the technology sector for quite some time. I actually grew up in, in Palo Alto at a time when Silicon Valley was just coming into being as a, as a phrase. And it's been fascinating to see the, the growth and development of technology and how it's intersecting all across our societies ever since. And a part of your work then at Google is overseeing the AI principles document, I presume, and then the implementation of those principles within Google. That's right. Well, we've been working on the AI principles for some time. It might actually be helpful to give a little bit of a, a history. Starting in maybe 2016, it was clear that AI was going to be a bigger and bigger part of our product portfolio. Google Translate, just to take one example, went from having the translation ability of, a say, a six-year-old, which was you know helpful but not great, to having the translation ability of a teenager. Not perfect, but pretty good, through the application of AI over the course of a, a summer. And that kind of remarkable improvement in performance really then start us down the path of saying not only you know, what are other applications we could be exploring, but at the same time, what are the implications of doing that? How do we make sure we not only sort of drive the technology forward, but we drive the, the thinking around ethics and how and when these new tools should be used? So that was a big part of our effort. I think starting in 2016, 2017, we were pulling together people from across the company and talking to people, external historians, ethicists, et cetera, to start to create more of a framework as to how do we think about this. From the earliest days, there had always been a lot of focus on machine learning fairness and making sure that algorithms were being used and applied in an equitable way. But there are a lot of other issues as well with regard to transparency and explainability, accountability, safety, when humans should be in the loop. And so that led us into Sundar saying we were going to be an AI first company. And then kind of in parallel with that, we set up a corporate OKR, an objective and key result of setting out what AI principles should look like as a framing document for all the work that was going on. So that work has been continuing ever since 2016, 2017. You mentioned talking to external people in the formulation of these principles. Did that include Microsoft OpenAI? Yeah, so our, our external consultations were through groups like the Partnership on AI, which was coming together, bringing together some of the, the leading groups in the space, as well as a variety of, of NGOs and others who are thinking about this and independent voices out there, academics and the like. We want to be careful in working with other companies, of course, for antitrust and other reasons, but through various uh, industry conferences and the like, I think you're seeing an emerging consensus around a lot of these issues. There have been some very public cases with Google that have raised ethical concerns. And looking at it from the outside, it seems as though the capabilities of the AI ran ahead of the implementation or the understanding. So you had things like bias in the data sets that were discriminating against some groups. Then there was the Project Maven issue, obviously. I assume that there's been a learning curve and that as these cases crop up, then you address them and that becomes part of this overall knowledge base for managing the ethical and responsible use of AI. What processes are in place to vet new systems as Google comes out with things? Absolutely right. This is a new sector and we're all learning as we go along and, and we've tried to take the mistakes we've made to heart as we developed new processes around this. So we have systems that review not just new products in development, but also commercial deals before we go forward. We have processes to review what papers are we publishing and how we, we publish hundreds of papers a year in open source code. We want to be thoughtful and responsible about how we do that. And then we actually have an escalation team internally, the Advanced Technology Review Council, that uh, serves as an escalation path 
where different teams disagree as to how to approach different things. So let me give you some examples of, of how that has worked. For example, people were going forward with facial recognition. We wanted to be very thoughtful and, and careful about how we approached it because we recognized the potential for abuse, discrimination, et cetera. We announced relatively early on that we were not going to make a, an API, an application programming interface, available for general purposes for facial recognition without additional safeguards for technology and policy. So that when we did launch a tool like a facial recognition for celebrities in, in movies, for example, you know, which actor, which actress would be in a given movie. We went in and had a human rights impact assessment done to think through how do we make sure it's a limited number of people used for limited purposes where there would be value to consumers, but we were minimizing the chances of, of misuse. Another example is when we were experimenting with lip reading. We actually had some innovations with regard to being able to read lips at a much better level than had been done before. That's a huge benefit to people who are hard of hearing, but there was also a risk of misuse, that it could be used for surveillance purposes in ways that we didn't intend. So we had a lot of discussion internally before we published a paper around that, and it was only after we thought through how to focus the technology in ways where only certain aspects of the technology would be applicable. So it was only at a certain angle, and you had to be close to the person to be able to read. You couldn't be reading somebody's lips from a distance. So that the use case was much more focused on helping folks with disabilities and not on surveillance cases that we decided to go forward with that paper. So those are examples of how the kind of back and forth goes within the company before we can push forward on some of these tools. On the celebrity facial recognition product, how is that used? You're sitting at home and watching a movie and you're curious as to the name of an actor who is in the show that you're watching. And that would be able to tell you more about that actor and maybe then give you a link to background information on the web about what other films that person's been in. In the development of that product, I've read that there was some tweaking of the data set because it was not recognizing certain black actors. How was that surfaced? And was that surfaced because of a more discerning review because of the problems that you've had in the past? We've been focused on the question of discriminatory applications of, of algorithms for quite some time. Any algorithm to some degree can be discriminatory. And so this is a problem that actually goes even beyond AI. Now, we are optimistic that AI is continually improving in, in these things. And we forget in many cases how problematic human level recognition and application can be. So we think there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. It is a deep problem, though, because it's not just a question of getting the databases right. And getting databases right is an important starting point to this, just as an example we were doing some uh, text analysis early on, and the way we used uh, raw material was to find books that were out of copyright, which were books that were written before 1930 or so. But we found that the natural language processing was tending to assume that doctors were he's and nurses were she's because of the era of the text that we were processing. Once you recognize that, you can correct for it and, and adjust your data set. So it's an example of how we make sure we get there, right? But it's also making sure that the teams themselves looking at it are looking at it from diverse perspectives. If there are questions of underlying social assumptions. In some cases, you know, they, the chemicals used in photo and film stock showed some skin tones better than they showed other skin tones. And that then gets built into your database. So we try and query these issues from a lot of different perspectives to make sure that in application, you get appropriate outcomes. When something like this facial recognition product is in development, these are not the sorts of things that developers necessarily are aware of or pick up on. Is there a committee then that looks at a product like this? And is there a checklist? I mean, how have you operationalized that review? I would say it does start at the very basic level. We are increasingly training all of our engineers working in these areas on the AI principles, on machine learning fairness, on a lot of the social considerations that need to go into building great products that work for everybody here. So that's the foundational layer of what we do. And then as projects move forward, we do have these checks and balances to make sure that there's appropriate review before they go through certain stages, before we launch a, a product initiative, before we 
go forward with a commercial deal before we make a decision to publish a paper. There are internal review committees that are looking at these kinds of questions. And it's tempting to say a checklist, but it actually really has to be more than that. Because one of the things you learn very early on is that the easy part of this exercise is putting out your principles with regard to safety and humans in the loop and accountability and explainability and fairness and more. The hard part of the exercise is that many of those principles conflict. Sometimes there are trade-offs between making a tool that's more effective and more transparent. For example, you could go into a doctor's office to be diagnosed for a disease. And if the doctor said, well, I have two potential tools here. One only uses two or three factors, and I can tell you exactly how it works, but it's only about 50% accurate. And then I've got a second tool that uses hundreds of different factors. It's very complicated. I couldn't really tell you exactly how it works, but I've never seen it be wrong. What trade-off would you like to make between accuracy on the one hand and explainability on the other? Now, there may be ways to transcend that tension, and some of our teams are working on ways to have both accuracy and explainability and transparency, but those kinds of offsets are what makes this work hard and fascinating and important. And among those trade-offs, certainly explainability and accuracy is one. Speed and accuracy is another. False positives and false negatives is one that I've thought a lot about because having lived in China, the judicial system there errs on the side of protecting against false negatives. They don't want anybody to get away who is guilty, even if that means sweeping up some people who might be innocent, whereas the U.S. system is the opposite. We're willing to accept that some people get away who are guilty as long as we can ensure that no one who is innocent is caught up in the system. So they have real-life impacts, those kinds of trade-offs. When you're looking at these checks and balances, are there people responsible for this in various teams? Is there a committee that is constantly reviewing new products or papers? And then I wanted to ask, what is the concern about publishing, which to me would be much less sensitive than productizing something. So yes, we do have a a responsible innovation team is responsible for working through our different product areas, whether that's on the cloud side of the house, the research side of the house, has their own internal teams as well. So they work in a complementary way to review these kind of things, both internally and then we have externally tried to contribute to the community conversation around this by putting out tools like the idea of facets. Uh, It's an open source tool for visualizing and analyzing and understanding what's in data sets or model cards, which are kind of a a nutrition label for algorithms to talk about how the data sets that something was trained on, what the intended uses are, et cetera. So if we can help the industry and engineers work on this in a better way, then that's a productive direction for all of us. And other companies are also contributing to this conversation as well. And I think that's a very healthy and, and helpful thing. On model cars, that's kind of like the food label, as you were saying, on products in grocery stores so that people can look at a model and understand where the data came from. Is that right? It's, it's a publicly available label. Yes, it provides researchers more information about the algorithm that they may be using when they get in an open source way. Open source is is incredibly valuable. We are one of the largest contributors to open source code bases in in the world, I think. And we publish certainly more than our share of, of papers to help contribute to the collective understanding about these issues. You can imagine, though, that certain tools, certain innovations might be misused. And so we have to be careful in balancing that. We want to raise the ability of everybody to do great AI work, to be able to use open source tools like TensorFlow to be able to innovate. But where there are particular kinds of technological innovations that we may have come up with, you have to think carefully before you necessarily put that out in an open way for anybody to use because of the potential for abuse and misuse. An example would be a facial recognition API, but there are other notions of publishing papers. Let's say the lip sync paper that I spoke about earlier uh, had been focused on tools that would be very useful for authoritarian governments to do surveillance of people at a distance. We would have been concerned about publishing that as a paper until we had developed appropriate safeguards and ways of of limiting those abuse cases. And in the publishing of a paper, how would you limit those use cases? It's very difficult. The same is true of open source, right? So if you can, for example, come up with an innovation and here are ways that it can be used in a safe way and the positive social benefits significantly outweigh the risks of abuse, 
you might be willing to engage in that trade-off. But if you have a problematic piece of code and there's not an obvious way of making it safe, secure, or appropriate for people to use on a wide basis, you might hold off. In some ways, it's, it's similar to the work we do on the security side with Project Zero, which identifies holes and, and vulnerabilities in code bases out there at, at Google and, and around the world. In many cases, we will hold off on publicly disclosing that for a period of time while the owner of the code has an opportunity to fix it, rather than just putting the vulnerability out there and creating a risk to users of that code base. But we do want to make sure that there's an incentive for manufacturers of all kinds of code to keep their code patched up to date and robust against attacks. So we're constantly trying to think about how we can use information for positive purposes to to benefit society. On the lip reading paper, in order to protect against misuse in the paper, do you just ensure that you're not disclosing anything that's reproducible? So, So you're talking about the principles, but not offering source code, or are there other ways that you're limiting? Stepping back, that's right. One of the ways you would think about providing disclosure within the security context or other open source context is talking about things at a high level that don't necessarily give a cookbook for how to, to implement something. Another way would be to look at the technology and say, well, that's actually, in the lip syncing context, very useful if you're right next to somebody and looking at them straight on. But as it turns out, that technique isn't very useful if you're 100 yards away and looking at somebody from an angle. So the first use case is more of the socially positive, you know, helping folks with disabilities. The second is more the surveillance. You limit what you publish to the first case, and you simply don't publish the research into the second case. Or at least we confirm that the research is more useful for the first case than the second case. And in many of these situations, it is a question of asking the question, what are the potential applications of this and how do we weigh them? And in many cases, maybe most or all of the applications are positive and useful ones. And we don't have to worry as much about the you know, potential abuses, but we want to make sure we've asked the question. The other case, obviously, that everyone talks about is Project Maven. There's been a lot of debate about what happened there, whether Google decided that there was a real ethical concern or that the project breached the company's principles or whether it was just turning into a public relations disaster and easier to step away from it, but make clear that you're not stepping away from all work with the Department of Defense or the national security establishment. I'm curious, how would you deal with that in the future, that kind of a situation? It's important to start by saying that we've worked with the U.S. Department of Defense since the very earliest days of the company. And some of our first commercial sales were helping them search databases they had. And to this day, we've worked with the Joint AI Commission and a number of national mission initiatives, NMIs, in areas like cybersecurity and healthcare and business automation, we work with DARPA, we work with each of the services. So we continue to be in this space and and expect to be for some time to come. The Maven situation was a complex one. It was coming up early on, just as we, and and honestly, as, as DOD was working through the appropriate frameworks for these kinds of initiatives. The National Security Commission on AI has actually put forward a useful framework in the last year or so looking at some principles that are similar in some ways to the principles that we've put forward. So Maven came out at a time when we were just finding our footing in this area. We had traditionally been a consumer company, not really as focused on enterprise. We've shifted significantly in the last few years around that. We have a very robust internal culture of discussion, debate. And so a lot of the learnings that came out of that were how do we make sure that we build an environment of trust and understanding so that our teams understand what we're doing We communicate that clearly. We get people on board. We build bridges between the folks in in the military and the engineers who are coming out of an academic environment in many cases so that we can actually get win-wins across the board. And I think we've, we've made some progress on that. And the more recent initiatives that we've been able to announce and talk publicly about externally and internally have started to build more of a culture of trust around our ability to do that. So in Maven's case, it wasn't really an issue of ethics. It was an issue of sort of communicating, preparing, explaining to the workforce and having an internal discussion to make sure everyone understood what you were doing. 
Is that fair to say? I think we could have done a better job of that. There's no question. And one of the lessons we've taken away is how do we communicate that in a clearer way? There's been a lot of discussion about the openness of culture. But I go back to people like Richard Feynman, who was one of the leading physicists in the country, dream of quantum computing back in the day who will also work with the Department of Defense and some of the nuclear projects. There is a possibility of bridging that gap and making sure that we're harnessing the most robust and creative parts of our economy and leading thinkers to help with national security and national defense. But at the same time, these are new areas and new issues. There are conversations about lethal autonomous weapons that go on at the United Nations. The Department of Defense has been very thoughtful and careful about thinking through the notion of having humans in the loop and having human judgments involved in the use of force. So I think we're all learning together about how to uh, approach these issues going forward. Is there any kind of a carve out for U.S. national security? I'm, I'm thinking on the lip reading model. Certainly, you'd want to limit its application to socially positive uses. But on the other hand, that could be a very powerful tool for the intelligence communities. If they were to approach you, how do you handle that? Is that, again, this advisory committee that you talked about that would review that? Do you make exceptions for U.S. national security that you wouldn't make for the commercial sector or open source where foreign governments might be able to use it? As your question suggests, a lot of these are case by case in the government or in the commercial sector because there are risks of abuse across the board. So you really want to understand exactly how that might play out. And that is a big part of what our internal review process goes through. We are a proud American company. We want to help with national security. And there are a lot of great applications where our work can be very useful. And we're continuing to explore those and actually move forward with any of them. This internal advisory committee, is that one committee or does that come together uh, on a case-by-case basis, depending on what talent you need to address something? Yeah, it's exactly right. It, as you can imagine, it's a layered process. There are individual teams that are advising individual product groups on projects and doing their own reviews. There are also a series of AI advisors, we call them, who are senior people within the company who have areas of expertise, and we will bring them in on an as-needed basis to advise on how we're doing and whether or not the team should be exploring other aspects. In many cases, it's not an up or down decision. It's a, boy, this looks promising, but you need to address the following two or three things before we can go forward with it. So that process often plays out. And then, as I mentioned, there is this Advanced Technology Review Council, which is the place where decisions that are disputed or they're very high profile would be escalated for review. And we've almost always been able to get to consensus around those issues and make sure we're doing things that we all feel good about. I've read that Google has turned down business or killed projects because of ethical concerns. If you can talk specifically about any of those, that'd be fantastic. If not, can you talk generally about what kinds of concerns you would run into that would cause you to turn away business or end a project? As you can appreciate, it's hard to go into specifics there because customers and potential partners are explaining a variety of things. And we don't want to get in a position of publicly judging the appropriateness of of what they may be doing. But as far as we're concerned, many of our tools and technologies are widely used by a variety of people. The equivalent of the electric company providing a back-end resource that's useful for lots of different applications. So it's probably less appropriate for us to get in and really have deep conversations about particular use cases. On the other end of the spectrum, are we developing things that are very custom, that our engineers are creating, that are one of a kind, that maybe only our tools could help someone accomplish? In that context, we want to be very careful and thoughtful about the particular application that we're building for. And so you can imagine any number of ways that a particular application might create an issue under the AI principle. You almost go down the list. Is there a risk that it doesn't have appropriate safety limitations? Could it be used in a way that doesn't have appropriate human judgment and human review? And think of the whole range of possible applications from governmental applications, law enforcement issues, and deciding whether or not somebody gets a job or gets a loan or gets medical treatment. Those are all very sensitive areas and we want to make sure they're going to be carefully used. How accurate are the tools? You've seen a lot of discussion about some facial recognition tools are very inaccurate and may be particularly inaccurate when it comes to minority communities or women versus men. We want to make sure we're not making problems worse in these areas. Obviously, we want to make things better wherever we can. If you're looking at explainability, AI is an incredibly powerful prediction engine. How do we try and think through 
are those predictions based on robust data sets? Are the algorithms taking into account all the different use cases so that we're getting it right? Particular applications can fall afoul of almost any of those different things and be somehow unfair or inappropriate in application. We've had examples across many of these. I would say in most cases, we've been able to navigate to places where there are safeguards in place or we've limited the use case and be able to go forward. But in in some cases, in partnership with commercial customers, we've had good conversations about, we actually think you might not want to use this tool for this purpose, but here's a different way you can go. That wouldn't create some of those same issues. And the partners, in fact, all cases I know, have been really interested in that feedback because they can benefit from some of the experiences we've had and some of the learnings we've developed over time. I know that you've published technical practices on how to implement the principles, and we can talk about that in a minute. But the problem with principles is that necessarily have to be very general, but they can get so general that they're really meaningless. And obviously, you guys tried to balance that, make them general enough that they're applicable across use cases, but not so general that they have no teeth. Are there any of the seven principles that are more difficult to implement or to make concrete than others? For example, avoid creating a reinforcing unfair bias. That is fairly straightforward. Be socially beneficial is pretty general. And and how do you measure that? They're all complex and all can be challenging. Asking a really profound and interesting question, which is how do you balance between high-level principles and very specific rules? The question about the checklist we talked about earlier. On one level, you want to have very clear rules, which are easy to apply. On the other hand, in many cases, the rules, precisely because they're so specific, don't answer a lot of in-between gap-filling questions. On the other hand, your broad principles, which are aspirational and get you the right direction of travel, don't fill in the gaps very well. So in a sense, it's like the Constitution of the United States that gets interpreted through the common law in specific cases, or the Torah that gets interpreted through the Talmud. When we have a tension between one, two, three different principles, how do we apply it in this particular case, given the realities that we have? All of them have aspects of how do you apply the general to the specific. If you look at something like principle seven, which is meant to be this Going to, we're going to take a lot of factors into account, the primary purposes and use, the nature and uniqueness of what we're working on, the scale and impact, what's the nature of our involvement. We are trying to have this balance between the, the broad aspirational notions and the, okay, we know we're going to have to get into specifics. The reason we have committees and review councils and, and checks and balances internally is precisely to raise those sorts of issues that, well, this sounded good, but in this particular case, Maybe we need to think twice about it. Or I originally flagged the problem, but as applied with these safeguards, we actually think this is okay. So that's very much the nature of the back and forth we have. That's an excellent analogy, the Constitution and and the law or the Torah and the Talmud. And we are very early days in this. A lot of the principles that are being published across uh, industry, but also by government, are converging on consensus. Do you think that over time that the analogous laws, the rules that will be defined under those principles will be codified in some way in a regulatory framework, for example? And presumably, just as laws evolve as society changes, the specific implementations or rules under the principles will evolve as well. I think they will. We have said that AI is too important not to regulate, but at the same time, the biggest risk might be not proceeding with AI at all because of the potential it has for solving big social problems like climate change or addressing world hunger and various other issues. So the key from our perspective is building acceptance and and trust at a time when there's not a lot of trust in institutions. How do we bring people around the table to have those conversations? There's an equitable AI research roundtable that's going on. There's a partnership for AI. 
we've had I, probably more than 20 different community workshops from people with different perspectives and making sure we're listening to a diverse set of views on these things. We put out the Google AI Impact Challenge, $25 million in grants for people who are doing important work with AI that would be socially beneficial. And then, of course, to your question, we're engaging with governments, international organizations. The European Commission had a high-level expert group on AI that came back with some findings. We've been engaged in Singapore, the OECD, the U.S., of course. The U.S. came out with a set of principles last year, which we thought were a useful grounding for a lot of this work. The European Commission is in the middle of a process to come up with a set of regulations for AI. And we've just filed a a lengthy submission there talking about the value of having a clear legal framework to make AI safe and ethical and trustworthy. So we think it can be a real benefit if we get this right for wide AI adoption. Where did you file that? The, The European Commission has an ongoing inquiry consultation period as they develop a set of regulations around AI, which will be Europe's counterpoint to the regulations that the U.S. put out last year. So in our filing, we talked about the notion of creating an ecosystem of excellence, that uh, there can be benefits for European businesses of all sizes, but there's currently a lack of coordination among the, the different European member states. So having a lighthouse center for AI research and innovation in Europe could be real positive. We talked about the importance of, of trust, and the, the European Commission has been very focused on high-risk applications. We have to be very careful because high risk can also be high benefit. And you don't want to retard progress in areas like healthcare and the like. But we think that there are ways of doing that, building on existing regulations and codes in areas like healthcare or financial services that can be expanded to deal with some of the unique challenges of AI and how do we have appropriate labeling. And then lastly, on the safety and liability side, making sure that there are safety rules that are appropriate where there's a heightened risk because of the use of AI and not necessarily sweeping too broadly to create more liability for all forms of software that are used by, at this point, probably every business in, in Europe. So I think if they get that framework right, it could actually be a, a great foundation for next steps. Here. And this isn't something that you can answer with your Google hat on, but Europe kind of sits between China and the U.S. China is very loose in its regulations. Europe is stricter on its regulations than the U.S. is, but adheres more closely to the values that the U.S. adheres to than China does. There's three systems in play. Do you think that it'll emerge that there'll be three regulatory frameworks following these three systems, or do you expect that the world will divide up into two large regulatory frameworks or that we'll ever get our act together to have a single regulatory framework? It's hard to predict, but I would say that the history of the internet has been one where it has been a protocol that was around the world with an awful lot of benefits from that interoperability, the ability to exchange goods and services and ideas. And so it's a powerful model, and we have to be careful to avoid a balkanization or a splinter net, so-called. The same is true with regard to other technologies. I mean, technology has been an incredible force for progress over the years. In the last 30 years, more than a billion people around the world have come out of extreme poverty. That's never been replicated in the history of mankind. So the ability of technology like AI and other advanced tools like quantum to solve some of our biggest problems is incredibly powerful. It would be helpful in that goal if different regulatory systems. And each country, each culture will have different areas of emphasis. But if the regulatory systems could be aligned and coherent and consistent, even if not identical. I I would say the same goes for issues like privacy or antitrust or intellectual property. Each region is going to be slightly different, but the more convergence you can see, the easier it is for innovators, academics, businesses to be able to share the benefits of new technologies broadly. Google Cloud is talking about offering ethics advice as a service, presumably because you've reached a point where you feel pretty confident about your process and the principles that you're implementing. Can you talk about the protocols that might be translated into a service, whether that's a direction you think industry will go? Because not everybody can afford to have people sitting around thinking about these things. I think we've learned an awful lot through our own experiences and, and we'd like to share some of those best practices and some of the things we 
We published with regard to our learnings of people in AI and other sort of guidebooks, we hope have been helpful. We've learned that it's important not to just offer the technical tools and research, but provide training that empowers and equips people to think more deeply about these kinds of ethical issues and the, the impacts of technology on people in society. I think we're a ways away from having you know, ethics as a service. A lot of our learnings are most usefully offered in the context of our own products and services. So as we talk with enterprise and cloud customers to just share, hey, we've seen people try this in different ways. In our experience, this approach has been the best. Here's some factors you might want to consider. That's been a conversation that people have welcomed. It's always cheaper to make your mistakes on someone else's dime. So if we can you know, share what we've learned over time, that's, that's a win-win. What's the greatest ethical challenge that you see for AI going forward? And let me qualify that a little bit. There's this debate that I get drawn into all the time that's personified by Zuckerberg and Elon Musk in their argument about the dangers of artificial general intelligence. You know, Musk saying that we've got to be thinking about this now and Zuckerberg saying that is so speculative and so far in the future that it's debating how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Where do you stand or where does uh, Google stand generally on that? And what do you see as the greatest ethical challenge going forward? Without weighing into the details of the Mark Elon discussion, our focus has been really grounded in, in our products and what we can do. My experience has been we always speak with the most credibility when we're talking about things that we know more about, when there's the products and services that we can offer to people. So if we can get on a good path where we have thoughtful processes to review the potential uses and misuses of AI, that actually sets a good framework for the future. If we go back to the notion of the Constitution idea, if we start off with a good foundation for the house, the house is more likely to be built in a, in a good way that we're all comfortable with. That can slow down innovation a little bit, but it's the, it's the tension of responsible innovation. Innovation is itself necessarily disruptive and creative. Making it responsible requires a little bit more measure and balance to, to get that right. But if we can do that, I'm very optimistic that the application of these tools, like the application of many tools before, have dramatically increased the standards of living for people in the United States and around the world. And I think we are doing our homework now to make sure that we get to that, that more positive version of the future. Are there big questions on autonomy, for example, that you think should be debated now in advance of the day when systems have an ability to operate outside the purview of human control? Well, I, our whole goal is to have systems that are shaped and structured and directed by people toward defined goals. So there's a risk of getting a little ahead of your skis sometimes in these conversations because our experience has been the more you're doing, the more you're learning, and the better your questions are, and then the better your answers are. So if we have an approach where we think about questions like humans in the loop and where that's appropriate and to what extent, that gives us a lot of lived experience that makes our answers to that next generation of questions better. I think we're an awful long way from our artificial general intelligence, but the idea of making sure that we are an appropriate structure for how we would apply different aspects of that, I think will get us to a better answer however many years in the future that come. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Kent for his time. If you want to go deeper into what we talked about today, you can find a transcript of this episode on our website, ionai, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. Remember, AI is about to change your world, so pay attention.